Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me here today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I suppose maybe uh, a health warning that I'm thinking through uh, this as much as anybody else is. Um, it's a, a complicated area and perhaps it's not a spoiler to say that the wicked problem facing higher education, um, as I've identified it here, is, of course, generative AI. Um, and as a as a teacher myself, um, I've had various experiences with it with my students over the past year. Um, but today I'm going to maybe just uh, try to think at a little bit of a more abstract level uh, to think of maybe a little bit more wider about about the context of this and possible ways of responding to it. Um, and I don't have all the answers and I'm really looking forward to your conversation and discussion. But to start with, um, what I'm going to ask you to do is we're going to start with a bit of a quiet section um, because I'm going to ask you to do some work. Um, and I'm going to ask you, if you can, to uh, either use the QR code or your colleagues will share uh, in the chat the link to this Menti quiz. Now, this Menti quiz is self-paced. There are five questions on it. Um, and I'll share my screen about the first question so you can move through the questions as you complete them. Um, but in the first instance, I'm going to just uh, share my screen of how people are answering this first question. So I know we have about 80 people in the room today, and I can see from my screen just over 40 who've responded. So I'll give it another minute or two for people to follow that link or follow that QR code. As people are catching up with that, the next four questions on the Menti quiz are quotes from students about generative AI. And I'm just looking for your responses. And I'm aware that some people might be watching this back as a recording. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm gonna mute my mic, but I'm gonna um, cycle through some of those quotes so you can just read them on screen. This... So just before I close off this question, um, I think this is probably not very surprising to us that, um, uh, that we'd have this kind of a bell curve around people, uh, mostly around this area, of mostly positive, just a few concerns, just a few little niggles. Um, and I think that's probably testament to the support um, uh, you are getting as colleagues within Harriet Watt um, and the discussions that are happening uh, within the university and the institution about generative AI. And this is a very, it's a very positive thing in that it, it, it sounds like uh, many of you are feeling uh, uh, quite aware um, but not, you know, uh, blissfully unaware, perhaps uh, quite informed about it. Um, and then, of course, we can't um, uh, dismiss the fact that there are some people who are more concerned um, uh, than positive. And indeed, a couple there were finding it very problematic. Um, and indeed, there are some people who are very positive about it, too. So keep that, keep this bell curve in mind as you go through the next questions, just as I mute. And I'll switch back to my slides and... Uh, for those of you who maybe aren't participating in the Menti or are watching the recording, can just see what people are um, responding to.
what do you have the output of this one? Output. Okay, thank you everybody and thank you for your engagement on this. Just a reminder that you can continue to fill in your answers to these questions for the next seven days up until the 13th of June. So the first question, uh, the first um, student post was uh, saying it was an incredible tool for assisting people's work. It uh, could provide inspiration and it could be used and it should be used by students to adapt the answers. It's the future. It's time we embraced it. So responses here. Um, not surprisingly, a, a lot of people saying they agree. Um, we've got a lot of responses here. I had not time to go through all of them, but it's certainly worth um, a read through. Missing the word critical, which is critical, somebody says. Somebody saying there to be careful that maybe there's a there's a line here, um, and the question is whether whether some of that adapting of answers from uh, ChatGPT or other generative AI tools is problematic. Um, but more or less, uh, people saying that they agree with this that it is an appropriate use, and it is a useful tool. Mostly agree. Deep understanding of subjects still important. So many things there. So in general, this is um, this was a, a post by students that most people agreed with. For the next one, which was um, saying that most people that this student knew uses it, um, but that that means that they don't learn. Um, it's good for basic information, um, and they think in the future um, assessment should change to live interview type assessments. Um, and I know that you'll notice on those uh, posts that students could vote up or down. And that one got two down votes, interestingly. So re reflections from yourselves here. Um, there is a, quite a bit of agreement here as well, that students should learn to use the basics before using the tool. And here we're talking about adapting the design of assessments. So that's a, that's a key point. And I think that comes up quite a lot. Yeah, a variety of assessments. So again, thinking about what the assessment modes are. Too many answers to go through here, but some interesting, interesting ideas here. Yeah, and then in terms of you, if this was your student, you know, this person is suggesting to explore further with the student. Okay, great. Thank you. Third question was a slightly longer one. Um, where a student was reflecting on uh, their previous experience, uh, being told uh, from feedback that their ideas were there, but their structure wasn't. Um, and that they um, have been using generative AI to help them and it's made a massive difference. Yeah, so this is quite common coming through in, in research that there are benefits around feedback for students um, and feedback that's written in a way that the student can adapt um, in a way that they can understand. This person here is saying being able to structure an essay is related to clarity of thought, so it still remains important. So the student is essentially possibly leaping, leapfrogging that opportunity to learn how to structure. Um, but as evident from their post, they're not getting the support or they haven't had the support previously to learn how to do that. Yep, these are all perceptions of students. That's what, um, what I was aiming for is to get students' perceptions rather than facts. And I think that can be the case in, in lots of, um, situations where we're talking about this, that we all have perceptions, um, but they're not all the same. Final student. I have worked hard for months and they have good results. 
but knows a few people who have used ChatGPT for the whole assignment. And they've done no hard work and they've done got better results. So this is fundamentally about unfairness. I like that this response is as if talking to the student and then bringing it back to a whole class discussion. So there's a wider question around ethics and students' awareness of eth ethics. It is a challenge. It is a very sad situation for that student, of course. Encourage the student to speak to the tutor, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In some ways, when I see some of the, the writing within the post that we got, I can I can tell the chat GPT wasn't used to create it. In some ways, that's a little bit reassuring because of the spelling errors. Um, yeah, this is the problem. And that's it. This is the wicked problem that we're looking at here. You know, is is it the case that the student should have been encouraged to use chat GPT or up, up to up until, until a particular point? How do we define that point? Um, and how do we how do we make things fair across the board for students? Yeah, thoughtful work to go in, to develop assessment for learning here. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for all of that. I'm now going to do the talky bit, uh, but thank you so much for all your contributions. Uh, so. I hope what that's kind of demonstrated that we're all that there, there are similarities. We're coming through with similarities across the board, but we're in different places. But also, students are in different places as well. Um, uh, we have different attitudes to where that boundary is in terms of what's appropriate and what is not appropriate use. So here, but here we all are still. Um, I would hope that what I'm about to say here is, is probably something you've all been thinking about. Um, our relationship to knowledge is changing. We work in institutions of knowledge and learning, um, and that relationship is changing. The learning itself, as we can see from those posts, or at least the proxies of that learning, that we, we is becoming harder to measure. So it's impossible, of course, to measure learning, but the proxies we use to measure it um, are becoming harder. Content, and that's a blunt word to use when I mean um, materials, artifacts, products uh, that we use in teaching and learning, are, are kind of losing their meaning and losing their authenticity. And by that, I mean, we don't know the provenance or the authorship. And this is the case across the board as well. Of course, this is around the internet, this is around information that we get, this is around now all the multi-modalities of uh, content that is being generated by uh, generative AI. And the te technologies we're using that we are kind of entangled with um, historically and in uh, education are problematic. Um, so I'm gonna come back to the, these points a little bit later on. But first to some recent literature, just to a few things I've read recently, just to, to pause, pause to thought about, think about them. Um, Fleckenstein and colleagues um, did uh, an exercise looking at whether teachers can spot generative AI content in student work. And both novice and experienced teachers could not identify text generated by ChatGPT. But not only that, both novice and experienced teachers were overconfident in their ability to make that judgment. So I'll leave that one hanging there. Another recent paper from Crawford and colleagues about um, the use of artificial intelligence by students for support. And this goes back to some of the, some of the posts there. Students' relationships with AI chatbots strengthen, their human relationships weaken possibly without the students even realizing it. And the question that they raise is just because AI can be used for social support, should it, as it appears to be at the expense of diminishing social support from friends and family. 
So in an area where we are looking at issues of student belonging, student engagement, even students' motivations for coming on campus, um, these tools might be providing and uh, support, but at the same time diminishing those interpersonal relationships and indeed those social skills as well. So another point to think about. Going further back now, before, before ChatGPT in 2019, Zawakti Richter and colleagues uh, did a systematic review of artificial intelligence in education literature. Um, and their conclusions uh, reflected that there was an almost lack of critical reflection of challenges and risks of artificial intelligence in education. And that for the most part, it was, it was focused very much on the solutions and the products and um, the computing aspect of it, rather than the uh, theoretical and pedagogical perspectives. Um, and there was, uh, as they said very presciently, there was a need for further explanation, exploration of ethical and educational approaches in artificial and uh, artificial intelligence in, edu in education, specifically in higher education. Similarly. Uh, Zhang and Aslan, a couple of years later, uh, went through literature in relation to artificial intelligence and education, and um, they called for uh, AI ethics and privacy to be discussed further, um, for more interdisciplinary understandings, because uh, previously there's been decades of artificial intelligence in education. Previously, it's been quite monodisciplined. Um, and also there needs to be more conversations across disciplines about this, what this means. Um, and as there is a lack of AI expertise among educators, there's also a lack of support and guidance for education around artificial intelligence. And you can see here in the list of things that they identified in the literature, they're all very familiar, chatbots, um, expert systems, agents, tutors. Um, the blue one, mach machine learning, is about big data, um, about those ideas of efficiencies and productivity and all that AI could bring to us. Um, personalization, uh, a very heavily critiqued term, this idea that um, AI will provide a very personalized uh, experience for students. Um, but the, the issue with that, of course, is that this, we need to know where they're going to be able to make those trajectories possible. And actually what's personalized is actually quite homogenized, but I'll come back to that. And then things around virtual learning environments. So there has been previous critiques of, of this area in um, in education, and perhaps we need to look back a little bit more to the history of this area. So my statement too is around narratives about AI and technology that they frequently do not align with educational values or practices. So we have um, a very large uh, gold rush, to put it that way, uh, in relation to the development of artificial intelligence. Um, it's very costly on many respects, not just money, but it's also costly on the environment and it's also costly to people too. Um, and it is uh, something that's been done uh, to scrape data, information, creative work from uh, the internet uh, to reproduce and, pr uh, uh, and produce content. And I think this is something that we as educators have to look very deeply at in relation to whether this is something that we are okay with. Again, we're in the knowledge business, we're in the business of learning. Um, is this use of, of data, other people's data, appropriate? And also the way that it uses that data to produce um, generative content, whether it's images or audio, video or text, um, and whether, whether we see that use as appropriate as well. So there's a very big narrative about that, um, that we have to be. So this is the space that we're in. I don't know how you're feeling right now, but this is how I'm feeling. Um, a little bit of vertigo, a little bit of not quite sure where to go from here. Um, but, it's, uh, but it's also something we have to inhabit. We have to sit in this difficult space right now, because if we don't sit and acknowledge that there all, all, are all these difficulties, um, we can't think about it. Um, I like this quote from Brené Brown about vulnerability. And I think, again, acknowledging where we are is acknowledging that we're vulnerable. Um, and it's about not winning or losing. 
So this isn't a race against, you know, students, quote unquote, cheating. Um, but it's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. Now, I think that in education, we sort of tell ourselves a story that we have control and we have systems that show that we have control over learning and we can plan things. And I suppose the underpinning idea of what I'm saying today is that maybe we have to sometimes release that, con that idea of control. And that takes vulnerability. Um, and, you know, you're all here today um, and you have shown up. So, you know, I know that at least you are willing to think about that and you are that's why you are here and you are thinking about these things. I find Aguirre's and Schoen's work very helpful to think about big picture stuff. So when we think about learning, single loop learning, Aguirre's and Schoen uh, say that single loop learning is the most common style of learning. Now their work from the 70s was based within organizations um, and it's about problem solving. So the improving the system as it exists. We get these results, we think about the results, we change our strategies and techniques, what we do to, uh, and, to, and then we, we work around that loop to get those results. What they argue is that double loop learning is more than just fixing the problem. This style of learning questions the underlying assumptions, values and beliefs behind what we do. And I think this is what we need to do now. This is where we have to question why we do what we do. And to quote from them directly, they talk about single loop learning is like a thermostat that learns when it's too hot or too cold, turns the heat on or off. The thermostat can perform this task because it receives the information and take corrective action. A double loop learning it occurs when the error is detected and it corrected in ways that involve the modification of an organization's underlying norms, policies, and objectives. And it's those norms, policies, and objectives that we need to think about. So, statement three, our underlying norms, policies, and objectives are being challenged right now. And we have to be aware of that. But the good news is we know things. Um, missing from that list was teaching. Um, and we don't want to forget the power of teaching and what it actually looks like for us. And that will be a variety of experiences. Not only do we know things, but I would also propose that critical pedagogies and particularly critical dig digital pedagogies. So understanding uh, the problems that technologies bring with them, as long as their solutions um, can also be a way of thinking about how we use technologies. Learning is about learning and teaching is about relationships. It's interrelational. And also we bring with us our human side. We trust, we trust our colleagues, we trust our students and we care about our students. Again, all of us here today, we care. That's why we're here. This research project, which is what the data from uh, the Menti posts that you saw uh, was conducted. We've done three uh, rounds of it now. And um, we started in spring of last year, and um, you can follow that QR code uh, to look at the project itself and the phase one data set. And we'll be releasing our second phase data set as well quite soon. We didn't know what students were thinking. We, we thought they were probably using ChatGPT, but we didn't know how. And we just designed a very straightforward Padlet. People could um, use anonymously, and they were invited with a QR code. And I was very conscious that it had to be anonymous, otherwise students wouldn't tell us things. Um, and for that reason, we brought on board student co-researchers to help us uh, bring that message across to students that it was a trustworthy space. There were limitations, of course, we couldn't verify who posted um, or how many times by the same person. Um, and the where posts, that I suspect had some chat GPT content. Um, and there were some that said I used chat GPT for my post. Broadly, the big themes were, as you may expect, phase one in spring, people were talking about it for understanding, for thinking, for writing. There was some awareness of the ethics and the problems. Many students talked in both phases about using it as an assistive technology. 
the first phase talked more about using it as a dialogue partner. They talked about the speed of support that they got from it. Um, but they wanted to use it and they wanted to be taught how to use it. Phase two, so autumn, was much more critical. There was more people speaking about how they liked to write, um, how they thought any use was cheating. They thought um, it should be used. So there was a more of a variety of answers. Um, and they identified that it was more about plugging a gap in the education they saw that they were wanting help uh, in certain aspects that they weren't getting from their tutors. Um, so a variety of things there. Phase three, I won't go into in much detail. It was specifically targeting postgraduate research students. Um, lots of concerns there, as you can imagine, about skills, writing skills, copyright. Um, very aware of the limitations, but many of them also using it and wanting to learn how to use it better too. So statement four, I think we need to reclaim some of the narratives on education and maybe relinquish some of the other things, the other ones that we are telling ourselves. So this is where we are now. It's a very interesting point of the year with this is our first full academic year with um, students and ourselves having access to some of these generative AI tools, but the experiment is still continuing. Um, and these are the big questions, of course. To what degree should AI literacies be incorporated into learning? What's the boundary of acceptable use? And how do we meet that variety of student opinions and experiences? And these are the things that I'm constantly thinking about in relation to my own teaching as well. This slide shows some things that I'm, I'm not claiming um, ownership of these ideas. Many. Uh, People have talked about this before, that maybe learning and teaching and maybe assessment could be less about the artifacts, the products, the content, more about the processes, the practices and relationships. But all I'd add to this is maybe it's not about following prescribed pathways. And this is where we have to think about double loop learning and questioning the structures and the processes that we have. How to assess? I don't know the answer to this, but I think we need more windows into learning to be able to assess. Whether we want to uh, converge or diverge, and by this I mean, are the challenges that we're setting for our students leading them on prescribed pathways? Or perhaps we need to relinquish a little bit the idea that there are prescribed pathways and we should let them diverge from those pathways. In fact, maybe that should be the goal to find divergence rather than convergence. And this links very directly into the way generative AI models produce content. They converge. They bring things to the center. They bring things to the norm. So you'll get very plausible, quite bland for the most part, depending on your prompting, generated content. So maybe one of the things to think about is finding ways to diverge away from that, that are authentic. So my final statement, I think, consider activities and assessments that require divergent thinking. Maybe we need to let go of control. You're already working around challenge-based learning, which is wonderful, um, but maybe think about where there can be more than one correct answer. And many of you are probably doing this already. So these are my statements, recap. Um, and I think we're all in different places, but multidisciplinarity is a way of thinking about it, a way we need to talk to each other about what we're doing. Narratives about AI and technology, these technologies aren't built for education. They're built for other things and for other reasons. They are not neutral. They have hidden pedagogies when they bring them in and they see learning often, oftentimes as a process of input and output. But we know learning and teaching is about more than just that. And we have to be very careful of the promises of efficiencies. Our underlying norms and policies um, are being challenged. That's a good thing, but it's also painful. We have to sit with that pain. What a degree might look like in the future might be very different. I know how much that work that would be, but we can look outside universities for other ideas. We need to reclaim narrative and education. 
And this is where critical pedagogies come in. What is the value in education? What do we believe in? What do we want our students to be empowered to do, to critique? They already are critiquing. They already are saying things that we should be listening to. And maybe those are the things that we can um, address in that double loop learning. But at the same time, if there is value in writing for its own sake, we need to champion that um, and not just go to the efficiencies of using these tools. Consider activities and assessments that require divergent thinking where there's not one answer. Imagine an assessment where you cannot predict where your students will take it. That's what I try to challenge myself to do. And this might mean re rewriting learning outcomes or maybe getting rid of learning outcomes altogether. Uh, and this is again about double loop learning and, and challenging ourselves to think divergently about things. So perhaps students could be the challengers. What if we invited them to challenge us, empower them to critique the power structures that we work within, um, and that for them to identify the norms, policies, and objectives that challenge us to think divergently? That's it from me. I'd welcome any questions or indeed get in contact via my email, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. Thank you very much.